unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth, and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Romans chapter 3, verses 27. It says, where is boasting then? And the Bible says, it is excluded, but by what law? Of works, the question, nay, he says, but by the law of faith. Today, I want to talk about the law of faith. Today, I want to talk about faith, not just as a doctrine, not just as a principle, not just as an idea, not just as an action, but faith as a law, as a divine law, as a divine law. Because there are many believers out there who or recite the challenge. Pastor, I am praying. I am applying faith like you teach, like the Bible teaches, but I don't seem to see results. I don't seem to see the answers of my faith. I don't seem to see the manifestation of the things that I believe God for. My faith is not working. How do I make my faith work? How do I make my faith effective? How do I make my faith with a certain understanding that can be interpreted by those that observe me as a believer to believe in the God that I profess, that indeed he is true and that he works? How do I make my faith personal enough to work for me? Because it's one thing to trust and believe that God can heal, but I don't see healing. It's one thing for me to believe that God provides, but I don't see provision. It's one thing to believe that God upholds, but I don't see that upholding of myself. How do I make my faith work? And tonight I want to help you see how faith is a law. Because when you understand how this law works, you will learn how to appropriate faith every other time, how to apply faith every time, how to communicate faith every time. And as you do that, you'll see the results of your faith. You'll see the answer of your faith. Why do we talk about faith? Why do we insist on the law of faith? Because it's the only law that guarantees your salvation. Firstly, the law of faith is the only law that guarantees your salvation. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8, he says, By grace are ye saved through faith, and not by yourselves. It is the gift of God. It is the gift of God. It is the gift of God. By grace are you saved through faith. Through faith. In Romans, somewhere it says, It can only be by faith that it will be of grace. It can only be by faith that it will be of grace. So I say, the law of faith is the only guarantee of your salvation. That's number one. But number two as well, it is the only law by which believers live. The Bible says in Hebrews 10, 38, the just shall live by faith. It is the law by which we live. So it is the law that ushers you into your salvation. But two, it is the law by which you live. When the Bible says that the just shall live by faith. It means the day you stop believing, you die. Hallelujah. But also, it is the only law that we understand by Scripture that directly pleases God. In Hebrews 11 verse 6, he says, Without faith, it is not possible to please God. Or without faith, it's impossible to please God. So we're talking of a law, one, that guarantees your salvation, true, that defines your living, but three, also establishes you in the relationship that pleases your God. It establishes you in the relationship that pleases your God. So understand if we emphasize it. Understand if we teach it. We're all born again. But Paul says we all labor that we might please him. 
We all labor that we might please him. God has not called us to please men. No. God has called us to please him. God has not called us to please the world. No. He has called us to please him. And he's saying that if you want to activate the law that pleases me, it is the law of faith. If you want to activate the law by which you can live, it is the law of faith. If you want to activate the law that grants you your salvation, that releases grace, it is the law of faith. It's the law of faith. But you see, we have very scanty ideas about this principle called faith. And so even though it's preached so much in many circles, more so in the Pentecostal and the charismatic circles, many people profess a faith that does not have the results that they so desire before God. And that's why God impresses it tonight to teach you, to help you understand faith as a law. Because whether you're talking of natural laws, whether you're talking of spiritual laws, these were laws that were set with their doing, aspiring to fulfill a particular command or will. And they have to work the way they're supposed to work because underlying them are principles. Every law has a principle that underlies it, okay? And those principles then help us know how to work with this law, how to connect with this law, how to be one with this law. Because when we connect with this law, then we have the results of that law. And so we're here to tell the Christian that faith the law, if you understand faith the law, you will see results you will see results. I always tell people that if you look at the Gospels of Matthew, Luke, and Mark, they record 19 miracles. But if you cancel the repetitions, they record 19 miracles. And of the 19 miracles, 12 of those 19 miracles, the Christ story said, be it done unto thee according to thy faith, or your faith has made you whole, or the faith has made him whole. Of the 19 miracles recorded in Mark, Luke, and Matthew, 12 of those miracles were by the faith of those men. So imagine that for every 19 sick people, you can heal 12 by the law of faith. That's a great number. There are many people who, when they start praying for the sick, they don't see healing as they have to. I have been blessed to be in crusades where men have been healed and we started writing of testimonies until the people who are writing got pain in their hands and failed to write and stopped because there were many people to testify. I've been in meetings where the healings are too numerous that if we were to testify, we probably would need a whole night and the next day to testify of people that have been healed. Why? Because we activate the law of faith. You must know how the law of faith works. Now, if you go back in Romans 3.27, he speaks of two laws here in this verse. He says, where is boasting then? He says, it is excluded. He says, by what law? He asks, of works, nay, but by the law of faith. Meaning, there are two laws here. There is a law of works, and there is a law of faith. And there are believers who are in the law of works, but think are appropriating faith. And because they are in another law, they will not get the results of the law they profess to be into. Because they are not. They are not. So here he tells us two laws. He speaks of the law of works and he speaks of the law of faith. And both of these laws work with believers. And like I said, there are believers who apply the law of works and think that they have applied the law of faith. Now, if I have to define for you the law of works, I'll define for you the idea in light to what it is and what it isn't. If you're talking of the law of works, you're talking of attainment. If you're talking of the law of faith, you're talking of atonement, okay? If you're talking of the law of works, you're talking about human merit. You're not talking about divine mercy. You're talking about human merit. You're not talking about grace. If you're talking of the law of works, you're talking about self-righteousness, not the righteousness that is God's gift to all who believe. 
There are principles that are underlying there. Likewise, if you're talking of the law of faith, you're talking about choice. You're not talking about chance. The law of faith does not have chance. I was chanced. By chance, I did this. The law of faith does not work by chance. You don't meet by chance. You don't commute by chance. You don't transact by chance. No, 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 no. The law of faith is not self-confident, but the law of works is self-confident because it's based on human merit and attainment, not atonement, okay? The law of faith is not self-reliant. It's not self-confidence. It is entirely reliant on God. That's the law of faith. But also, the law of faith draws grace, not human effort. We're not against human effort, but we're against the order which comes before. Does grace precede human effort? Or does human effort precede grace? If you are the kind who seeks to apply human effort to attain grace, then you are in the law of works. But if you're the kind that receives grace first, and then grace enables you for the effort that is necessary, then you're a man that is working under the law of faith. That's the principle. It's that simple. It's that simple. Now, these things that seem like are simple, these are not things that Christians have mused on. They've not meditated on, gone around in their spirit to carry the full understanding and appreciation. Some people ask me questions. Somebody says, Apostle, I believed. Why did this person die? And I don't know where to begin from. Because I would need to give them a sermon first. And at that hour, they are mourning. And the instruction then would be, let me mourn with them. Are you hearing me? But here, God is trying to help you now separate the law of works and the law of faith. If you start believing and then attain a self-confidence that is not reliant on God's operation, but your own merit and ability, your own works and the list of resumes or CVs that you have, then you're a man of works. And if you're a man of the law of works, then the law of works will serve you. The law of works will pay you for debt. The law of faith will reward you according to grace. And if it is grace, it's unmerited. If you have two men, one of the law of works and one of the law of faith, the man of the law of faith will always do better than the man of the law of works. Why? Because the spirit realm rewards the man of works only according to what he has done. But when it comes to the man of faith, it rewards him according to what God has done in Christ. What a glory. That's why he says, for if sin came and death reigned by one man, Christ, how much more they which receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in this life by that man, Jesus. He says, when you embrace the law of faith, you reign. If you embrace the law of works, you survive. There is nothing in the world you can never do that will ever be enough for God's idea and vision for your life. Let me say it again. There is nothing in life you could ever do that will never be enough to provide for God's idea concerning your life, for God's dream concerning your life. That is why Jesus came. God knew that no man could by reality do to the fullest to satisfy the requirements needed for God's desire and vision to be fulfilled in human nature. What did he do? He sent Jesus. He sent him as a propitiation of our sins. He sent him as a mediator of a covenant. He sent him to stand in the gap to help fulfill what God knew we could not fulfill by any standards because human Human nature is wrought in the law of works, not the law of faith. It's what human nature is. It's not wrought in the law of works. It's wrought in the law of faith. But before you understand the law of faith, you must understand the integrity of the faith of God. Remember when he tells his disciples that have the faith of God or have the God kind of faith? When we're talking about the God kind of faith, what do we mean? You cannot appreciate the law 
when you don't understand how the God kind of faith works, how the faith of God works. The Bible gives a very powerful statement here in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3, if you read in the Amplified. He says, if we are faithless, he says, or do not believe and are untrue to God, the Bible says he remains true. He remains faithful to his word and his righteous character, for he cannot deny himself. Let's first discuss the integrity of God's faith. For, for the Bible says, Paul says in Timothy, he says, if we are faithless, let's just say you walk up and say, ah, I'm not going to believe. I'm not going to carry faith. Even if you don't carry faith, the Bible says the faith of God still abounds. Because the God kind of faith is not subject to your unbelief. Even if you say, ah, I don't believe, the God kind of faith still carries its own active and inherent power to perform what God has said. So he says, no, if we are faithless, if we do not believe and are untrue to him, the Bible says, but yet he still remains true. He stays faithful to his word and his righteous character, for he cannot deny himself. He says, look, you can wake up tomorrow and stop to believe, but because you stop to believe, that mean that I, God, stops to believe. No, that's your problem. The integrity of God's faith, the God kind of faith, it never stops to work because another man does not believe it. It might not work for that man, but because it hasn't worked for that man, it doesn't hold back God's idea. God's idea still stands. You must note that in the back of your head as I go deeper here. That the integrity of God's faith is irregardless of where the man chooses to stand. Even if a man fails to believe God for divine health and that man dies and gets to heaven, God will still tell him, uh uh, I did my part. I did not stop believing because you stopped believing. I did not stop fighting because you stopped fighting. But rather, you choked what I had designed to do, what I had planned, and what already still is available even now to do. But the question is whether some things are reversible and some things are not reversible. Remember, the Bible says that we are born of an incorruptible seed. First Peter chapter 1, verses 23. It says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of the incorruptible seed by the word of God, which live and abide forever. Do you know what the Bible means when it says you are born by an incorruptible seed, which is the word of God? When it says that the word of God is incorruptible, it only means that there is nothing you can do as an individual to change what it says and its effectual power to perform. But there is something you can do for it not to perform in your life. But that I mean that for it, as the word itself, it's void of power. No, the power is still available for it. But it will only mean that you short circuit it. You refuse it. You don't know how to respond to it. And because you don't know how to respond to it, you don't have the results that you're supposed to have as a believer. But because it has not worked for you, it doesn't mean that the word of God is without effect. No. Even if God doesn't heal the sick in your meetings as a preacher, don't conclude that God does not heal the sick. I've seen men like that, by the way. Somebody says, oh, I don't believe in divine healing. You ask them, why don't you believe in divine healing? I prayed for my mother and my mother was not healed. Oh, I prayed for my cousin or my friend or my neighbor's dog and he did not heal, he died. Ah, I don't believe in divine healing. Oh, so, you think that the word of God has lost its integrity. The God kind of faith has lost its integrity because you have failed to know how to apply the law of faith. We have people who say, oh, I don't believe in the speaking of tongues. Why? They tried and the tongues failed because they think they have to try. <laughs> How many people no longer believe in divine providence because they believed God and failed to see breakthrough? They say, ah, I don't believe in divine providence. Why? Because if I do, then why did this happen? If God is this, then why is this happening in the world? If God is supreme and sovereign and powerful, so why is this happening in the world? Why isn't he stopping it if he's God? No. He too is subject to the law because he made it. He created that law. He commanded and instructed it to perform the way it's supposed to perform. And so you just need to align yourself to that law of faith and understand how does the law of faith work? Simple. 
understand how the law of faith works. There is something I need to probably explain to some of us so we appreciate what I'm saying. There are two kinds of things that I've seen in this law of faith that I've realized that many Christians have overlooked or some, unfortunately, do not know. Now, there is such a thing as the seed faith. The seed faith. But also, there's such a thing as saving faith. Okay? There is a thing called the seed faith. And there's also a kind of faith called the saving faith. There are two kinds of faiths that work in the law of faith. The seed faith and the saving faith. Let me explain what I mean by that. The Bible says in Luke chapter 17, verse 6. The Bible says, And the Lord said, If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, he said, You might say unto this sycamine tree, Be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey. Okay? He said it should obey. It should obey. That's what he said. But if you study keenly and look at that verse Again, you realize that he did not say, you will say. He did not say, you should say. He used the word might. Okay? He said, and the Lord said, if you had faith as a grain, as a mustard seed, ye might say, until the sycamine tree. And he said, be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted into the sea, and it should obey you. Ye might say. So when God uses the preposition like might say, it means it could perform, it could not perform. He might say to this tree. But there's also a possibility, a probability of failing to say. That's why he uses might say. Okay? So when people say, oh, if you have faith as little as a mustard seed, what do we mean when we talk of a faith as little as a mustard seed? Some people think that they are believers who don't have faith, but they're believers, but all they need is faith the size of a mustard seed. No, that's wrong teaching. And I'm going to prove to you later that that is not how so God is trying to impress on us. But why does he use the word might? He uses the word might because he also puts a possibility that you can actually say and not have the results of what you say because there are underlying principles, even as you say. He's trying to say that the saying is not all. No, there are other principles that rely on this saying as well. That if fully applied, then you can speak to the sycamine tree, be thou plucked from here and root and be planted in the sea, and the Bible says, and it should obey you. But here he used, ye might, ye might say. When he says might, it means there's a possibility of not being able to do it. He's using the example of saying, but he's saying that behind the saying, there's also an underlying principle or underlying principles that govern this. That when you have them full, when your obedience is coming full, then you'll have the confidence to, you will say to this sycamine tree, or that mountain, be thou plucked out, be thrown in the sea, or be planted in the sea, and it should obey you. And so he's trying to tell us, seed faith does not necessarily bring the full results of faith. It could, it could not. Remember Luke 8, 11 says that the parable is that the seed is the word of God. That not everybody who says, oh, I've had the word, I've had the word, I've received the word, that they will eventually have the results of the word that has been said on their lives. There are people who are sleeping with prophetic words that were spoken unto them either by prophets or teachers or pastors who were speaking under the unction of the Holy Spirit, they were given utterances that were speaking into the destinies of these individuals and they have believed God and waited on God and they've not seen these things and they're saying, ah, maybe because I've not seen this thing, therefore God did not speak. Listen, this word, the word of God, the Bible says, it calls it the sure word of prophecy for which you do good to take heed as a light that shines in darkness. But because this word is sent as a prophetic word from God, I mean that it works for everybody, but it should work for everybody.
but it doesn't work for everybody. But it should work for everybody. But it doesn't work for everybody. But it should work for everybody. That's my point. It should work for everybody. But it does not work for everybody. Has God sent his word? Yes. Is it a prophetic utterance touching our future? Yes. But does it work for everybody? No. Does that mean God is a liar? No. The integrity of the God faith still stands that even when we are faithless, he abides faithful for he cannot deny himself. Oh, that this word of faith is incorruptible. It cannot change because you've changed. But it might not work for you because you don't know how to respond to the seed faith. So many people, because they do not know how to react to the seed faith, they don't know how to react to the seed faith, okay? So here, when he uses the word mustard seed, it's one of the smallest seeds, okay? In adds, even the slightest word, the slightest revelation, the simplest word read in scripture can command the biggest dimension of faith. Wow. It can command the deepest, the biggest dimension of faith. You don't need the semantics of vocabulary to command the spirit realm. There are people who speak so simply, but yet have very amazing results. And there are people with libraries full of books, they even speak English that scarce, but they don't have the results of faith. Because the results of faith are after a spiritual language, a divine language. And that divine language has a way of communicating to the things that are living and the things that are not living. To communicate to the world of men in the realm you see, but from the realm men do not see. So when he speaks of the mustard seed, he used the word you might say. In other words, there's even a possibility of it not working. That's why he uses the word might say. You might say. But there's also a possibility of it not working. It's there because many people don't know how to respond to faith in its seed form. And what is faith in its seed form? It's in the word. Faith in its seed form is the word. Look at 11. The parable is that the seed is the word of God. When you read of the facets of hearing where he speaks of the farmer that sows on stony ground, on thorny ground, on hard ground, on good ground, he says the parable is that the seed is the word of God. So when you talk about the mustard seed, we're talking about faith in, in, in the form of a word. Because the word is seed. Faith in its smallest sense is a seed, and seed in its smallest sense is the word of God. It's that simple. So when we say that there are people who receive words and those words work for them, but the people that receive words and those words don't work for them, again, like I said, it depends on how you respond, how you react to the seed. Okay? When you know how to react to the seed of faith, then you will get into the realm of saving faith. I call it saving faith. Because it brings the answer, the desired answer for what we've asked for. It brings the desired answer for what we've asked for. And that's what he says. For example, if you compare that with Mark 11, 23. Mark 11, 23 says, For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain. Now, oh, in Luke, it's a might, okay? Here in Mark 11, he says, Shall say unto this mountain, okay? Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart but shall believe those things which he said shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he said. Here in Mark, he did not say he might have whatsoever he said. Here in Mark eleven twenty three, 23, he doesn't use might. Why? Because he has brought another underlying principle that favors the law of faith for which it's not just enough to know what to say but also the believing, the not doubting in your heart, the trusting of your words that what you've said shall come to pass. He says, then ye shall have whatsoever you say. Now, you see, in Luke, he only spoke about the saying. That's why he left the possibility of might say. And it works. But when he says might say and it works, it means you might also say and it doesn't work. But here, when he gets to Mark eleven twenty three, 23, he's giving 
a bolder statement of it working. Why? Because he has put an underlying principle, an underlying principle that makes this law effectual. And here he says that if you say to this mountain, in Luke it was a tree, here it's a mountain. Mountains are bigger than trees. But here he says, whosoever, whosoever, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart. Now he has added an underlying principle. But shall believe that those things which he said shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he says. He's trying to tell us that there are pillars. There are pillars to help us activate this law. There are things underlying. When we know these things, then the law of faith becomes effectual. It comes with its answers. That's what he's trying to tell us. And so, one of those pillars is believing in your heart. It's believing in your heart. It's believing in your heart. And believing your words. Okay? Believing in your heart and believing in your words. Remember, the underlying pillar here Okay, in Romans chapter 12, verses 3, the underlying pillar here, the primary thing, is that the Bible says God has given to every believer the measure of faith. He has given to every believer the measure of faith, not a measure of faith. No, he has given to every believer the measure of faith. He has given to every believer the measure of faith, not a measure. The Bible there says the measure of faith. It means when you believe Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he gives all of us equal measure. And all of that equal measure comes in the element of the seed, okay? Which is the word. Which word dwells in our hearts by the person of Jesus Christ? And so when that word dwells in our hearts by the person of Jesus Christ, every believer in the world has Christ abiding in them by faith. And that is the measure. That means God has given every believer a starting point. There are no men with better points than others. There are no people with better startings than others. No, all of us, when we believe, we all have the same measure of faith. 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 Measure of faith. And so, don't disqualify yourself. And so when we say, oh, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, remember I said that the seed here is the word, okay? When you receive the word in the person of Jesus Christ, it equals to every believer. Every believer has a seed of the word within them, and that word is in the person of Jesus Christ as it dwells in our hearts through faith. It dwells in our hearts through faith. So every believer has that measure of faith because it is the faith of the Son of God that dwells in us because we have faith in Him, okay? So to receive Him as your Lord and Savior, to believe in your heart that He died and rose again and was raised for your glorification, to confess with your mouth His Lordship, when you become born again, we all attain that measure. That seed is there, okay? Some people forget that when Jesus is talking about a seed, mustard seed, in that time, He's not talking to people who are believers, who are born again. During that hour, Jesus had not died and raised from the dead. And so because he had not died and raised from the dead, he's not talking to believers. He was talking to men which followed him, but not New Testament believers, not regenerated spirits, not new creation. If any man be in Christ, is a new creature. So when you become born again, you get the seed of Christ through the word. May Christ, the Bible says, dwell in your hearts through faith. Okay, when you say, I receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior, bam, the measure of faith comes into your spirit. So everybody has that measure of faith. So when you say, oh, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, no, it makes sense to talk to men who don't have the seed Christ as Lord in their hearts because he had not died and purchased eternal salvation. But when you are talking about a new creation, every new creature, every regenerated spirit, every man who is born again has that measure of faith, that seed of faith, the ultimate underlying seed in the person of Jesus Christ through faith. But when that seed settles, the word of God settles, 
That seed has to grow in you. The word has to grow in you. He says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. Do you know the word abiding there? The Greek word there for abiding is staying present. Staying present. No, no, no. You don't just read because, oh my God, COVID is in the world. Let me read the word so I don't die. COVID is in the world. Let me read so I don't die of COVID. You're reactionary. So what if everything is going on well? What if there's no disease in the world? What if you don't have any problem, financial, physical, or any other of that sort? He said, if you abide in me, and my word abides in you, stays present in you, constant communion, he says, you shall ask whatsoever ye will, and it shall be done unto you. That is to the glory of the Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So the underlying is that we all have the measure of faith when we believe Jesus. But, like I said, you have to grow the word. You have to grow it in you. You have to allow it to bud. You have to allow the seed to grow so it can become a plant with leaves and fruit. Okay? And that takes us to the next principle. Here, he says, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Simple. Oh, so if I hear by the word of God, faith comes to me. Yes, it grows on you as you continue acquainting yourself with the word. Listen, a man who sits in the word every day, every week, every month is different, will always be different to the man who visits it. No, they will always have differences. Oh, but Apostle, I don't see this yet. Give it time. Give it time. You're incubating. You're in incubation period. It will sooner or later sprout out. Yeah, there are times we've planted seeds and we water them and we see nothing. But then I mean that we lose hope when we know the ground in which we've planted reach our hearts. It later produces the results. It later brings the answer. You just learn to grow. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 3, it says a very fundamental statement. He says, We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you toward each other aboundeth. He says, Your faith grows exceedingly. Your faith groweth exceedingly. That means this seed can grow. God has not called you to say, ah, now that I have the measure of faith, I can sit back and wait for that measure to work. No, he has called you to grow that measure of faith. He has called you to grow it. And how do you grow it? Hearing the word. Hearing the word. Don't read the Bible because you have a problem. Read the Bible because you're growing. I tell people, if you get a newborn baby and then starve them, don't give them food or milk, what happens to those babies? They get malnourished. Now, if a baby or any person gets malnourished without food, how do you expect to live without the word? How do you do it? For example, we all see what is happening in the world, COVID and all these things. I can't help to wonder why some people still refuse to turn to God. I don't get it. How can they refuse to turn to God? How can men refuse to turn to God? Of course, some are. Many are because they are reacting. And hopefully through this, we'll have a revival for the world. But Christians are not supposed to be reactionary when it comes to this law. Because when you get into the realm of reactionary, it means you are in the realm of might work, might not work. You have to exercise your spirit to get to a point where the word of God must work in your life. There is no shortcut. There is no other way. Abide. Stay present to the word. And I will not stop to emphasize this. Paul says, I'll bring you in remembrance of this always, even though you know and be established in the present truth. There are things that we have to overemphasize and emphasize and emphasize and emphasize until our people get them in their spirit. You cannot run away from the word of God. If you have a problem reading, get an audio Bible. <laughs> if you're not the listening kind, read. Whatever you have to, you must be present to the word. 
how I wish people knew how starved spirits look like, how starved souls look like, how I wish that some of you, your eyes of the spirit would open to see how many people are healthy outside, but their spirit souls are starved. They're malnourished. They're malnourished. And so if any disease comes in their bodies, it will kill them. Because remember, every disease begins from the spirit realm and then manifests into the physical realm. The Bible says the things we see are not brought about by things which do appear. The Bible says, why we look not at the things which are seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So the eternal things, the things that are not seen, bring about the things that we see. Everything physical has a spiritual foundation. People out there might not believe it because they don't believe the word you read, the Bible you believe. But let God be true and every man a liar. The Bible says, how God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Why was he healing all that were oppressed of the devil? Because his sickness is a demonic oppression. And so healing them that are oppressed of the devil was a divine mandate on the person of Jesus Christ. Healing all that were oppressed of the devil. That means all sickness is demonic. All sickness is demonic. No matter how much we, you know, call it, you can give it any name. I've prayed for people with bipolar. Oh, it's medical, yeah. I've prayed for people with schizophrenia. Oh, it's medical. And then you pray for them and they're healed and they never need drugs ever again. I've prayed for people with acute depression whose minds have broken down. Oh, this might never heal, this might... You pray for the person and, you know, spirits manifest and the person is healed. When Jesus comes to Peter, he says, Peter, Satan has desired to sift you. The other word there is demanded. Satan has demanded to sift you. Who demanded? Satan, not God. God does not tempt any man with evil, neither is he tempted by evil. All good and perfect gifts come from God. Sickness is not from God, and sickness is not out of natural occurrence. No. Even when you get to your point of death, you should live well. It's possible to live a life of divine health. That's what Peter said. By his stripes, ye were healed. 224. Not will be, not should be, not could be, not might be. Ye were healed. Praise God. Hallelujah. And so, he says, your faith groweth. It has to grow. You have to allow it to grow by staying present you know, to the word, present in your word. But also, the other underlying principle, and I've seen many people, I think, teach it wrongly, I've seen that when people are stressing the issue of speaking, some people speak of the speaking as a means to believing. Yet, we believe, and therefore we speak. That's the principle, one of the underlying principles of this law. He says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 13, he says, we having the same spirit of faith according as it is written, I have believed, therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore do what? Speak. We speak what we believe. I tell people, if you have not believed it, don't speak it yet. Exercise yourself to the point of believing it. How? By meditating and musing around it until you see the physical picture and not doubt in your heart. When you don't doubt in your heart, then you find yourself Speak it. You speak it. You speak it. The other underlying pillar also is action. But I see that the law of works also confuses men when we're dealing with the action. Touching the law of faith. And this is a confusing part. With the law of works, action is made to attain. Okay? With the law of faith, faith is applied, then the works follow. The works are as a result of the faith. Okay, and that's why it says in James 2.17, even so, faith, if it hath not works, it's dead. If faith has no works, it's dead being alone. In other words, you have to apply works, okay? If you believe God and say, oh, I have believed for a job, I'm confessing for a job, what are you doing? Buy clothes of people who need a job. Oh, I don't have money for that. Then start planning and talking like somebody going to get a job. Start going on the internet, reading about the job you're going to do. I remember when they called me for the interview at the bank, 
And the lady called me and said, oh, I want to interview you. I didn't ask for the job. They called me and said, hey, can you come in, bring in your papers? We want to give you a job. So I remember the night I was going for the interview. I remember very well, I went on the internet and read everything touching banks. And everything I was reading, I was saying, I'm reading you because I'm going to apply you. I'm reading you because I'm going to apply you. I'm reading you because I'm going to apply you. Of course, I had to get the job to the glory of God. So it's consummated by your actions. And lastly, but not least, it is not time and space bound. Some people think, ah, you know, it's not yet time to believe, oh, now is not the hour to believe, oh, it's too late for me to believe, oh, it's too early for me to believe. No, 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 no. Faith is not time bound. Jesus says, having eyes, they don't see, having ears, they don't hear. Least at any time, they should hear with their ears and see with their eyes and believe in their hearts and should be converted. And the Bible says, and I should heal them. Least at any time. This one, even if you choose to believe God now, it can happen. But Apostle, what do you mean? With God, all things are possible. Who should we believe? Oh, but this is not practical. In your mind, but not before God. Not before God. Not before God. Oh, but this cannot happen. Yes, in your revelation, but not before God. Oh, but this cannot do this. Yes, in your head, but not before God. Ah, but now, even in this time, with God, all things are possible. The only challenge is this, that our spirits have not been exercised in the learning, in the power of possibility. Because every time we think of the power of possibility, we imagine it with our carnal minds, with the interpretation of fallen nature. That is why our visions have to be elevated. So we see the way God sees things. We will see the full picture, the will and purposes of God, for which he has given such liberty and freedom to the sons of men. If the church one day took time to internalize what it means for with God, all things are possible. All. But you see, how can our normal human brain think it? It cannot. It's so hard. It's too deep to even imagine. These are things sometimes I think through. I sit and I muse around. And it's too much for my brain to even imagine the power of possibility and what that could mean beyond your wildest dreams and expectations and prayers, he's able to do. And sometimes for me, the question is how far has the church gone in this? And how many are really ready to believe God? If this small virus is shaking the world, and sadly, even in places where believers are, no, no. That's not how so we know God. That's not how so we know God. Faith is a law. And you can apply yourself to that law and have the results of that law. I have given you the pillars. Of course, we have been teaching some of these pillars over the years, but I'm trying to bring them together in one so you know all these are simply pillars of one law. Because it stands with principles under it, and those principles underlying define then how this law works. And because I have taught the word now, I have triggered faith in your spirit. Now let's pray. Come on, wherever you are, just open your mouth. Speak something remarkable concerning your story. This could touch your ministry. This could touch your life. This could touch your relatives. This could touch your family. Your businesses are being aligned because God knew even in this hour that there was provision for you after COVID. For us, he told us this year that regardless of what happens in the world, our economies will go up. Our finances will go up. And we believe the word of God in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we thank you because your word has been sent out and it's achieved exactly what you have sent it out to achieve. And I believe that the God kind of faith has worked for you in Jesus' mighty name. 
Father, we thank you because you've heard our prayer. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. If you've made that prayer, believe that you have received. Celebrate like you have received. Clap your hands around like you have received. Dance around if you have to like you have received. Thank God like you have received. And let me charge you by God, don't ask for that thing you've prayed for again that way. Again, ever. Every time you remember it, remember it with thanksgiving to the glory of God. Hallelujah. And so if you're there and you've never given your life to Christ, I want to give you an opportunity to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You can repeat these words after me. You just say, Jesus, I have heard your word. I choose to believe in my heart that you died and was raised for my glory. Tonight, I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 41 466 4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero, make manifest.